thank everyone for being here tonight. Uh, what a thrill for me looking out here at the River Thames and to be literally on the side of the Houses of Parliament is, uh, is a great privilege for me. Had a marvelous tour this morning. I'd never been inside Parliament before this morning just to see the chambers. And we in America love watching the Prime Minister's questions. <laughs> and we love the lady, I heard she's now in the House of Lords, who used to be the Speaker, would say, order, order, when things were getting a little out of control. But we, we love that. I love seeing those places. Listen, I know when people like me come to uh, places like this, uh, we often talk about church-state relations or about religious liberty or maybe even the you know, Christian foundations of democracy, et cetera. And those are all important themes, and I've written and spoken about them. But I thought I wanted to talk about something in a way simpler and more profound. And here's the first thing I want you to think about. The, the very presence of the church, the endurance of the church, for the past 2,000 years is worth thinking about. The church that has existed in the context of ancient empires and medieval monarchies and modern nation states and totalitarian systems, sometimes extolled, very often persecuted, and yet is still here, I think is deeply odd, is deeply strange and worth reflecting on. It's practically an empirical verification of Jesus' prediction that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. So what I want to think about and reflect on with you is, what is it that has made the church, despite its failures, and of course we know them all, and the, the great sins that have happened individually, collectively, and institutionally, granting all of that, what is it nevertheless that has made Christianity so consistently, to the present day, a powerful cultural and social force? That's what I want to talk about. I want to begin in a perhaps a counterintuitive way with a young uh, Hindu law student who arrived here in London in 1888 to commence his studies. He was at first um, so shy and so unsure of his English that he didn't want to venture outside his room. I'm talking, of course, about uh, Mohandas Gandhi. Eventually, he overcame his, uh, his shyness, and he fell in with a group of very devout Christians who challenged him to read the Bible. And of course, Gandhi was insatiably curious, so he started to read the scriptures. Like a lot of first-time readers of the Bible, he had a very difficult time with the Old Testament. But the New Testament electrified him, especially chapters 5, 6, and 7 of Matthew, the Sermon on the Mount. So Gandhi reads about enemy love. He reads about the power of nonviolence. And he comes back to his Christian friends, filled with excitement, at what he discovered. And his Christian friends uh, smiled at him rather condescendingly and said, well, yeah, those are nice ideals and maybe a handful of saints live that way, but we really don't you know, take it that seriously. See, but sometimes you need an outsider to read our text with fresh eyes. And I think Gandhi brought that freshness to it and he realized these were not just pious ideals. In fact, these were principles that could transform lives individually and transform society. He had discovered, if I can borrow Peter Morin's phrase, some of the dynamite of the church. Now, I'm going to interrupt myself to say, I know it's a little dicey for a Catholic to be talking in Parliament about dynamite. I understand that. I understand it. But Peter Morin, you know, the co-founder of the Catholic Worker Movement, said, we've taken the dynamite of the church, dunamis, right, the power of the church, we placed it in hermetically sealed containers and have sat on the lid. It's time to blow up some of the dynamite of the church. And of course, Morin, the great apostle of nonviolence, meant we need to unleash the power of the gospel. And I think Gandhi, in his own way, stumbled upon some of it. And then how wonderful that Gandhi becomes and his social action becomes what we call today a meme. So Archbishop Tutu in South Africa, Martin Luther King in my country, John Paul II in Poland all imitated the nonviolence that Gandhi learned from chapters 5, 6, and 7 of Matthew. So I want to talk about this dunamis, this power. And I want to do it in terms of three um, themes. First of all, the metaphysics of creation. I think Christians have a very distinctive view of the basic nature of reality. Secondly, I want to go back to the Sermon on the Mount. Our ethic follows from our metaphysics. And then finally, I want to reflect on the Paschal mystery, on the dying and the rising of Jesus, which stands at the heart of all evangelization. 
Because mind you, tonight, everybody, I'm here not re- with my, you know, political commentator or cultural commentator hat on. I'm here tonight really as an evangelist, a proclaimer of the evangel, the good news, which is, by the way, the dynamite of the church. It's about the dying and the rising of Jesus. So those three things. I, and my, my hope is it shows what the church consistently brings to the cultural conversation. Okay? So first creation and the metaphysics of creation. There's a line from St. Augustine. It's in the uh, City of God. And I, I think it's the, the central argument of that great, you know, 1,500-page text. Namely, we become what we worship. We become what we worship. Worship from an older English word, worth-ship. Every person in the world, I, I don't care if you're, you're an ardent, saint or you're an atheist, everyone worships something. Paul Tillich, the Protestant theologian, said, all you need to know about a person, you can learn by asking one question. What do you worship? In other words, everyone has a sumum bonum. Right? There's a highest good. We would not have gotten out of bed in the morning unless implicitly we had some sense of a highest good that's animating. We would not be here. Just ask the question, why? five or six times about why we're here tonight. You'll get to your sumum bona. There's some highest good. And you become aligned to what you worship. And this becomes the base of Augustine's great critique of Rome, doesn't it, in the city of, of God. What were the Roman gods and goddesses like? Augustine said, well, they're, they're vain, and they're self-absorbed, and they're contentious, and they're above all violent. Why are we surprised, therefore, he said, that Roman society takes on those very qualities? Augustine said, the church proposes the worship not of those gods, but the worship of the God whose name is love. God is love. Your own uh, G.K. Chesterton told us long ago that the language of Trinity is just the theologically correct way of stating the fact that God is love. If love is something God does, or love is an attribute that God has, I wouldn't have to appeal to the Trinity. But if I say God is love, straight through, that's all he is, then in his own most nature, there must be a play of lover, beloved, and love. So the Trinity is just an elaborate way of stating that God is love. Augustine said, the Christian community is that which is ordered to the God who is love, worships the God who is love, and thereby becomes attuned to that love. That's the central argument of the city of God. That's what makes it the city of God as opposed to the earthly city. So now look at creation layers. Why does God create? That's a very interesting question, hard to answer really. Why would God create? God has no need. God is God, perfect in every way. God creates, therefore, as a sheer act of love. Love means to will the good of the other. That's all God can do in relation to the world. God can't benefit from the world. Therefore, the very existence of the world is a sign that it has been loved into being. Not there is this the result of dumb chance, not there simply uh, without purpose, but the world is there as the result of love. What else can we see? All creatures must be related to each other. They all come forth loved by the same source. Therefore, when I find the deepest ground of my own existence, I found the deepest ground of your existence and of yours. And indeed, as St. Francis said long ago, of brother, son, sister, moon, the interconnectedness of everybody and everything in the universe follows from the doctrine of creation. What else can we find? That God makes the world nonviolently. Look in so many of the myths in the ancient world that God or the gods make the universe through some primal act of violence. There's some warfare, and in the, in the victory in that war, the world comes into order. But there's none of that in the Bible. God doesn't wrestle some rival to the ground. He doesn't have to conquer some opposing force. But rather, through a sheerly nonviolent act of speech, God gives rise to the world. Order comes through love and through nonviolence. What else can we see when we look at the biblical account? 
that we Catholics, I think, especially understand this. As, as things come forth in the gorgeous poetry of Genesis, the first day, and then evening came, morning followed, the second day, and then evening came, morning followed, the third day, the creatures come forth in a kind of liturgical procession. Who takes up the, the end of that procession? But human beings. Who comes last in a liturgical procession? but the one who's to lead the prayer, to lead the praise. Now we get the biblical vision. St. Augustine saw this. It's right at the heart of the city of God. What's our task? Our task is to lead all of creation, interconnected, to lead all of creation in a great chorus of praise, ordering the world to the God who has brought it forth in love. There's Christian metaphysics. Now, line up the philosophies, and mind you, very influential philosophies to this day. They will articulate a basic understanding of reality. Most of them are contentious. Most of them are antagonistic. Notice how Christian metaphysics is not. The God who is love brings forth the world in nonviolence and then lures the world back in right praise. I've argued for years that maybe the central theme in the entire Bible is orthodoxy. I don't mean, first of all, right belief. But orthodoxy, in its basic sense, is right praise. What's the problem? What goes wrong with us? Bad praise. Now watch it throughout the Bible. I don't know one exception to this. When Israel goes bad, it's because they run after false gods. For the Bible, the, the distinction is not between believers and non-believers. It's between true praise and false praise. What was the trouble with ancient Rome, Augustine said? False praise, praise of the wrong gods. A world ordered in love to the God who is love looks like something. Augustine called it the city of God, right? But that's our fundamental metaphysics. Now, can I suggest to everybody, the Sermon on the Mount, I'm coming down to my next point. The Sermon on the Mount is not an ordinary ethic. You know, if you line up the ethics of Plato and the ethics of Aristotle and the ethics of Cicero and the ethics of Kant and the ethics of, you know, Peter Singer, wherever it is. And then you say, well, there's the ethics of Jesus. That's the wrong way to think about it, as though it's one philosophical proposal among many. The Sermon on the Mount is a vision of life that follows from the metaphysics I've just been describing. If you accept that vision of reality, then you will live in a particular way. Your life will look like something. It will look like the Sermon on the Mount. If you try to put that into ordinary ethical categories, it won't make a lick of sense. In fact, I don't know any philosopher who sounds like the Sermon on the Mount. There's good reason for that. Because it's now the Logos of God telling us how to live in accordance with this deep uh, metaphysics. So let me look at a couple of features of the Sermon on the Mount. I'm going to get to the dynamite that, that Gandhi saw. But let's begin with the um, Beatitudes. The Beatitudes are about right praise, I think. There are four uh, negative Beatitudes and four positive. Blessed are the poor in spirit. What does that mean? I would render it this way, because makarios is the Greek there, and blessed, people say, or happy. Some of you would suggest lucky might be a translation of makarios. How fortunate you are. If you're poor in spirit, how lucky you are, how fortunate you are, how right-minded you are if you do not worship material things. You don't worship the goods of the world. Now, again, we all know this, but Christianity is not a puritanical system. It's not a platonic system. It's not a dualist system. God makes everything, and it's good, and the ensemble is very good. We're non-dualist. We don't... We don't uh, uh, marginalize or demonize the things of this world. However, we can't worship them. They can't become the summum bonum. Now, you think that's an abstraction. Well, look around. It happens all the time that people make of the goods of the world, whether it's material things, it's the money that, that can buy material things. That becomes the organizing principle of my life. I start to worship those things. Now I will get off kilter on the inside of my life and I will radiate disharmony and unhappiness around me. 
Therefore, how blessed you are if you're detached from material things. You're not going to worship them. So you know, what Augustine again told us the fundamental problem is always mistaking a creature for the creator. That's always the fundamental problem. If I'm unhappy, my life is, is disordered. That's why. I've taken some worldly good and made it the summum bonum. You can't do that. So you're lucky, Makarios, if you're detached from it. Secondly, this is the second of the negative Beatitudes. Blessed are they who mourn. I'd read it this way. How fortunate you are, how lucky you are, if you're not addicted to psychological good feeling. You don't worship your psychological uh, contentment. Nothing wrong with psychological contentment. I'm all in favor of it. If you can get it, that's great. I prefer it to the alternative, right? But I mustn't worship it. I cannot make it the summum bonum of my life. You know, I, I, being in the Westminster Hall earlier today and standing where one of my great heroes, Thomas More, stood on trial, if Thomas More had believed that his psychological well-being was the summum bonum, he never would have come to that point, right? And, and Moore's a good example because, you know, this great humanist and a man of wit and humor and friendship, he, he loved the things of this world. He loved psychological well-being, but he didn't worship it. He didn't think it was the summum bonum. How lucky you are, therefore, if you mourn. Third of the negative Beatitudes, blessed are the meek. Again, what a peculiar thing to say. I, I mean, from Aristotle to, to the 21st century, Name another philosopher who would say there is a key to, to happiness is to be meek. No, no, we, we tend to extol power. And again, power is not bad in itself. God described as powerful, right? Political power, cultural power, nothing wrong with them in themselves. But we can't worship them. And again, you think that's an abstraction. Well, I mean, people in this room especially should know better, right? That that's one of the great temptations. Do you remember... Um, I always find in, in the uh, great Lord of the Rings stories that one of the most frightening scenes, it's not, it's not you know, the orcs and all the, the battles and all that. It was a scene when, when Gandalf, right, the great Gandalf, the great wise and good wizard, looks at the, there's the as I'm wearing the ring, <laughs> looks at, at the ring of power. And you could tell for a moment that even the great Gandalf is beguiled by the ring. He wants it, you know. And what would have happened if he had given in to the seduction of power, if he had worshipped power, the havoc that would have caused inside him and in the world around him. How lucky you are, therefore, if you're, if you're meek. You don't worship power or make it your summum bonum. Again, look at Moore, one of the most powerful people in his time, culturally and politically. He didn't eschew power, didn't demonize it, but he didn't worship it. If he did, he wouldn't have come to, to Westminster Hall on trial. And then finally, blessed are they who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness. You know, I, in some ways, friends, this might be the most seductive of them all. So there's wealth and there's pleasure and there's power. But the last one that we tend to worship in the place of God is honor. Some people can live without, you know, wealth, pleasure, and power, but by God, they want honor to be respected, to have titles, to be thought highly of. Some people will do anything to procure honor. They'll do anything to avoid losing honor. Honor is good in itself. Aquinas calls it the flag of virtue. It's pretty good. Isn't it? We're, we honor people that we think, oh, that's a person of virtue. Let me put a flag on him or her. Let me give them a title. But if you fall in love with the flag and the title in themselves, you start to worship it. And now your life gets off kilter. So don't worship these four things. Worship God alone. Now, listen to the four, I'll call them the positive Beatitudes. How blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. It's a beautiful way to put it, of course. What's the, what's the one thing you should worship? The will of God. To, to be righteous. To, to want what God wants. How happy you are if that's the summum bonum of your life. Above wealth, pleasure, honor, and power that you want what God wants. You want the righteousness of God. That's what brought more to, his, to the culmination of his life, wasn't it? That he loved righteousness. Relatedly, how blessed are the single-hearted. 
or the pure of heart. Some translations have it. Kierkegaard said the saint is someone whose life's about one thing. It's, it's a lovely definition, right? It doesn't mean that, that the saint lives this monotonous life. Look at more. I mean, a life like, like your own, like many in this room, a man of affairs and politics and, and diplomacy and so on. His life was anything but monotonous. But yet it was about one thing. He didn't worship anything else except the will of God. He was single-hearted. How blessed are the merciful. Now, here's the Augustinian principle, isn't it? You become what you worship. If you worship the gods of Rome, you'll, you'll, you'll start looking like them. If you worship the God who is love, you will look like mercy. And, and how wonderful you know, that the King James renders has said from the Old Testament. Beautiful Hebrew term as tender mercy. That's who God is. That's who God is. And in that tender mercy, he gave rise to the world. In that tender mercy, he calls us to worship him, to lead a chorus of praise on behalf of the whole world. Therefore, when you worship God, you become yourself merciful, full of love. And then the last one, and this brings me back to Gandhi and his uh, followers, how blessed are the peacemakers. How do we make peace? By becoming peaceful in ourselves. I've had the privilege in my life of knowing, I think, a, a few real saints. And, and that's the mark, isn't it? Is, there's, a, there's a peacefulness because they're ordered. They're like the harmony of a rose window. You know, all the elements that, that center around the one place. They're grounded. They're anchored. And peaceful people tend to radiate peace outward. They're peacemakers. Just revisit for a second the, the text that, that Gandhi found so compelling. If someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn and give him the other. Well, I love the interpretation that, that specifies this in terms of, of the culture of Jesus' time. You would never have used your left hand in any kind of social interaction that was considered unclean. So if you strike someone on the right cheek, that means you've hit them like this. You've hit it with the back of your hand, and that was a sign of contempt the way you treat an inferior or a slave. So what does Jesus say? He doesn't say, run away or acquiesce. What he says is, stand your ground and turn the other cheek. I think, what does that accomplish? It mirrors the injustice and violence of your aggressor back to him. It's not acquiescence or passivity. Gandhi got that, didn't he? It's not passivity. It's standing your ground and trying to lure that aggressor back into a right vision of things. I apologize in advance if you've heard this. I've told this story a number of times before, but it's such a beautiful exemplification of the point. It has to do with um, a Bishop Tutu, but when he was a young man, and he was on this um, sidewalk over a muddy street in Johannesburg. And he's moving along, comes to a narrow place, and there was a, a white man who was very racist who met him. And he said, get off the sidewalk. I don't make way for gorillas. And so Tutu got off the sidewalk, and he gestured very broadly and said, I do. <laughs> See, what I like about this story is it exemplifies this principle rather well. Tutu didn't fight back, so, you know, fighting fire with fire, which doesn't accomplish very much. But he didn't run. He didn't run or, or passively acquiesce, but rather in this provocative way, he mirrored back to the aggressive person his aggression, trying thereby to lure him into a different vision of things. It struck me when I arrived here a couple days ago, just with jet lag and all that, I, I wandered down to uh, the area around Westminster Abbey, and, and I saw, of course, the statue of Gandhi out there, and I thought uh, of, of that young man in 1888 who, you know, was shyly making his way to British society. And then, of course, the cross on the facade of the abbey, right in the middle, is Martin Luther King. And King learned that from Gandhi. He learned the power of this and made it happen in my own country in a remarkable way. I mentioned, too, John Paul II, and we shouldn't overlook that. John Paul II, who affected this massive social change, first in Poland, then throughout the Soviet empire, Look, when I was a kid in the 1970s, if you had told me the Soviet empire would collapse with merely a shot being fired and that a main actor was the Pope of Rome, I would have thought you were living in a fantasy world. But by God, it happened, right? By God, it happened. 
the dunamis, the power, the dynamite of the church that's in the Sermon on the Mount, which is reflective of the metaphysics of creation. See, when you start acting in line with the deepest rhythm of reality, you're going to unleash power. Okay, let me just do one more uh, stop with you. And that's now at the heart of the Paschal Mystery, the heart of evangelization, the cross and resurrection of Jesus. How strange the cross is. And in a way, we have to back away from our own experience of the cross. I'm wearing this, you know, decorative cross. And we naturally say, well, what a lovely religious symbol. And it, it evokes, you know, peace and prayerfulness, etc. No, 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 no. We've got to go back to 2,000 years ago. And, and if someone, you know, saw me walking around wearing this, and they said, yeah, that's a religious leader. They think I had utterly lost my mind, right? Because this was meant to terrify people in the ancient world. Yeah, you know, one of the, one of the clues, it's very interesting, read uh, Paul to the Romans, and you'll find this peculiar line. Paul says, you know, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. What a strange thing to say. I mean, could you imagine Confucius saying, now, you know, by the way, let me just preface my remarks by saying, I'm not ashamed of the ethics I'm going to teach. Well, no, of course not. He, he thinks they're wonderful. You couldn't imagine the Buddha saying, you know, let me just say as I begin, but I'm, I'm, I'm not ashamed of the Eightfold Path. No, this is the path of liberation. Mohammed would never say in a million years, by the way, I'm not ashamed of the Quran. So, I mean, why does Paul say that? Because I, I preach one thing, Christ uh -huh, and him crucified. What? It would have struck people in the ancient world as a supreme anomaly that you'd be proclaiming someone crucified. The Romans got the practice, they think, from the Persians, but the Romans certainly perfected it. Uh, stripping someone naked, that was part of the humiliation of the torture, nailing them or, or roping them, tying them to this, this cross beam, and then leaving the person to, to die in this literally excruciating way, right? Excruciate from the cross. Often taking days uh, to die and then being left for the, the wild animals to devour the body. I mean, it was like the most horrific thing. That's why it was, it was reserved only for the most despised in Roman society and for slaves and for those who were you know, considered the lowest. Moreover, it would have been the clearest indication possible that you were not the Messiah of Israel. Because one of the marks of the Messiah was he would deal with Israel's enemies and he would reign as, as Lord of the nations, read the Psalms and read the prophets as they describe the messianic task. They would deal with Israel's enemies. They would reign as the Lord. So the clearest indication possible that you were not the Messiah is that you were crucified by, by Israel's enemies. So, and your, your own N.T. Wright um, has made this point over and over again. From a purely historical standpoint, what's exceptionally hard to explain is how in the world these Christians launched a messianic movement while they were proclaiming this. Because the, the beautiful thing is they didn't hide it for a second, did they? They, they didn't hide the cross. Paul puts it out there. That's the one thing I talk about. That's the one thing I'm going to tell you about is Jesus crucified. And I'm going to declare him to be the Mashiach, Christos, the Christ of Israel. How do you explain that? I can't give you a whole disquisition, but I think the only, even from an historical standpoint, the fact of the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. If Jesus had died on the cross, remained in his grave, I mean, who cares? Who cares? When I was coming of age, there were a lot of attempts in the academic world to, you know, turn it into a myth or a legend or a symbol or a, a sign of Jesus' ethics going on. Who cares? Bore me to death with that. Paul wouldn't have cared one bit about that. Paul did not tear into these cities and say, hey, everybody, there's a dead man whose ethics is very inspiring. You know, what, what Paul said over and over again, he's anastasis, anastasis, resurrection, resurrection. And it's the only way to explain the coming together of this proclamation, of this strange instrument of torture. This is the Paschal mystery, everybody. It's the evangel. This is the good news. So how did they read these two things together? And I'm going to suggest it now in light of what I've been talking about. How do they read together the dying and the rising of Jesus? What do they see in the cross? but all the effects of bad worship. Read the, the Passion narratives. 
and you have cruelty and you have hatred and you have violence and you have stupidity and you have you have institutional injustice you have every permutation and combination of human dysfunction all of which on the biblical reading are born of bad worship when you say jesus took upon himself the sins of the world that's what it means that on the cross we see everything that bedevils us and terrifies us everything that goes wrong with us but in the resurrection they saw that god's love is more powerful than all of that. Father, forgive them, they know not what they do, that, that all of the dysfunction of the unorthodox world, I mean the world that worships wrong, all of that is swallowed up by the divine mercy. You know, something in the uh, resurrection accounts that's so important, I think, is let us say we were telling the story in a Hollywood way today, you know, so this wonderful person, this innocent man is done to death and betrayed and he's denied by his own friends and put to death brutally and then he's back from the dead. We would do it, he'd have a machine gun like Rambo or something or you know, he'd be, he'd be a, attacking his enemy. Or if Quentin Tarantino would make that story, he'd, he'd seek revenge, right? But the fact that in the resurrection accounts, Jesus always does two basic things. is he shows his wounds very poor move, is The wounds of Jesus are meant to signal the dysfunction of the world. The, don't play the game of I'm okay and you're okay and everything's fine and we're all doing basically well. No, no. The wounds of Jesus remind us of our dysfunction. But then having shown his wounds, he always says, Shalom. Peace. Peace. In martial arts, there's a move that's called, the, or a, a discipline called Aikido. And Aikido is not direct punching back or fighting back. Rather, it's using the momentum of your enemy against them. Right? So you definitely get out of the way or you use the movement of your enemy to throw him to the ground. The purpose of Aikido is not to destroy your enemy, but I heard a practitioner say this to me, to leave him laughing on the ground, to realize that I, I can't beat this person. He always has a way of outmaneuvering me. Can you see the nonviolence in the Sermon on the Mount? And above all, the cross and resurrection as a kind of sacred Aikido. Jesus taking upon himself the sin of the world and then deftly outmaneuvering it, not fighting it on its own terms. That's the Rambo, you know, mythology, which is as old as the Epic of Gilgamesh, right? That story's been told again and again and again. Then there's this story. Then there's this story. The dysfunction of the world undone by the love and forgiveness and shalom of the Creator. I think everybody, that's what they saw. That's what they saw. That was the good news. That was the evangel. And so Paul goes now careering around the world, and he wanted to go to Rome. He ended up in Rome. He wanted to go to Spain. He wanted to go to the ends of the world to declare there's a new curios. There's a new Lord. Because he saw in the cross and the resurrection, that a great victory had been won. I want to read you this. I'll close with this. That marvelous quote from, um, from Colossians. He, Jesus, this is Paul speaking, he disarmed the rulers and authorities and made a public example of them, triumphing over them. Now, what's he talking about? But the Roman practice of parading one's conquered enemies through the streets. Think of Caesar and Vercingetorix, right? Bringing him back from Gaul and then parading him. To, I conquered this man. I, I make a public display of him. So Paul imagines the powers and principalities. All those powers predicated upon false worship. Undone now. Undone by the cross and resurrection of Jesus. That's what we brought everyone to the public conversation for the past 2,000 years. I'll close with, with this image. I, I'm staying in this the hotel right across the river there, and my room is a spectacular view of this whole complex, right? And so I've been contemplating it quite a bit the last couple of days. And you notice the beautiful, you know, Pugin neo Gothic architecture silhouetted against the sky. But then you see hovering over the whole thing is the Union Jack, which, if I'm right, is three crosses, right? One on top of the other. How weird, everybody, isn't it? How weird that at the center of that design 
is the gibbet, is the, is the instrument of torture on which this young Jewish rabbi was put to death 2,000 years ago. You see, we're like Paul. We're like Paul. We're not embarrassed by it. We're not ashamed of it. We hold it up. Because that cross is now seen as the sign of conquest. That God's love and God's peace, God's nonviolence, is greater than anything in the world. That's what we continue to bring to the public conversation. That, I think, is the dynamite of the church. God bless you all. Thanks. Thanks.